Hello and welcome to the TGH College Hardwood Podcast. I'm Joe. With me is Greg, as always, here to recap some college basketball, what's been going on in the college basketball world, and preview the upcoming week of games. It has not been the most eventful last week, and it won't be the most eventful week this week as we have very few games. But Greg, how are you doing? Excellent. Had a had a great Christmas. Got out of town for a little bit. See some family. Uh, watched a little bit of basketball, but uh, mostly over Christmas is football because we went you know three days without a single game really in, in college basketball. So we'll settle for a little football. I know that's more your world than mine, but uh, definitely definitely uh, a nice relaxing Christmas. So how about you, Joe? Pretty good Christmas. Um, yeah, it's been. A little bit as weird as it sounds a little bit lighter of a uh, schedule for sports watching it there is football there is nfl there is college but it feels like the uh things have settled down from watching three different sports at once it's only down to two for me as much as uh i can and that's been okay because we'll pick it back up this week and conference play will be starting any minute now but before we get started we do have one thing to talk about greg that is kenny Payne and kentucky and louisville now kentucky uh, destroyed Louisville. We had some uh, some money on that game ourselves. It just seemed like you know fourteen and a half points. I think it was was just thirteen and a half. Thirteen and a half was ridiculous uh, for Kentucky. Um, so we, we we bet on that. We expected Kenny Payne to be fired, uh, especially amid all the rumors with Louisville's roster, uh, with Karan Davis, with with everyone who who's been in the program. <laughs> it, the rumors have been bad. The losses have been bad. The culture seems like it's been bad. Uh, the sound bites have been bad from some of his press conferences, but they seem like they're sticking with them. And I think that is because they can save money doing it. If they fire him now, I think they save like $2 million, or they, they would have to burn through $2 million. Whereas if they fire him, they would have to pay him. Or if they fire him now, they have to pay him $2 million. So that's the only thing I can think of. Greg, any thoughts on that? All right, it's just This is embarrassing at this point. Like I am, I have secondhand embarrassment for Kenny Payne. Like, this is almost getting to the point where, and I, I'm sure it's, you know, like you said, it's a contractual thing. It's a money thing. Like, but it's almost getting to the point where he might want to think about resigning, but I guess, I don't know how the contract works. If, if he resigns, does he get a, to get a buyout or anything like that? I, I would imagine there's uh, something for him sticking around. That's the only reason he wants to stick around. Cause I'm, I'm pretty sure he's probably embarrassed too. So uh, not, we didn't pick this game last week, uh, but like you said, we did. Uh, and, and my dad listens to the show. Dad, I only bet 10 bucks on it. So don't, don't freak out or anything. We're not, we're not betting the mortgage on the game. Um, 13 and a half was the spread, or at least that's what Joe and I locked it in at. It turns out to be about a 20 point margin. Pretty much what we expected. There was a lot of blue in the Yum Center. It's just, it's, it's, I mean, if it wasn't for something contractual, I would say it would be time, but, uh, you know, he got the, the, uh, the AD comes out and says, you know, we're sticking with him and, you know, doesn't necessarily give him like a vote of confidence, like not a, not a, you know, a long-term thing just says we're sticking with him for now. So that basically, he might as well have said, Joe, I don't know if you would agree or disagree. He might as well have said, we're just letting him finish out the year. Like, does anyone see any realm where he ends up, you know, coaching next year? I, I, I don't, I don't, otherwise I, I don't know what the point of coming out and saying something is. You're not really, unless you're, you're hearing the voices so much at this point from the fans that, you know, you have to say something, but I don't know, man. It's just, it's, it's, it's embarrassing at this point. Yeah. It's, I, I get that they want to save money um i get that they're also probably trying to find their place in conference realignment right now that could have a big effect on all of their sports because louisville is one of the few universities that has a good basketball a good football and a good baseball history we'll say because they don't have a good program right now in basketball that's for sure um but yeah it's 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 i think it's just saving money i think it's hey if, if we fire them now what is that going to lead i'm sure they're already looking for the next candidate i'm sure they're going to be one of the first schools to hire their next coach uh, they're not going to be playing in postseason basketball. They're not going to have to worry about, um, you know, t- after the ACC tournament where they're going to have a first-round exit, most likely they're going to be ready to hire someone right away. So that's maybe the thinking is we'll save some money. We'll just let them finish it out. The fan base could be apathetic, but as soon as we hire that next guy, they're going to be right back. To, but you're right, it is very sad because this is – I would not consider Louisville a blue blood. I think there's five or six programs that are blue bloods. Everyone can have those debates. But they're right below that tier. They're, you know, they're right there. They have some national champions. They have some really good players in their history. They have some really good times in their history. They do have a little bit of down times in their history. This is one of those. But it's sad. Like, you, you have all the resources at your disposal at Louisville that you might need. 
including the new Yum Center and everything that obviously has been around for uh, probably like 10-ish years now, but uh, some other coaches didn't have, like Rick Pitino when he started there. Um, it's just, it's very sad. They need to make some moves, and I expect that to be done uh, by the end of the season. It's just, at this rate, I guess maybe they're figuring it can't get much worse than it already is. If we fire them, then I guess we can, there's no excuses anymore. We, we, we're going to save that for later, so I don't know. Yeah, Joe, it's just two things I want I, I just, you've jogged my memory on or, or brought into my mind. Um, the first, I know we had a conversation in the offseason, me and Joe and some friends, about, you know, what are the top 10 programs? And I said, no, nah, Louisville's not. And I'm like, we really started going through it. And I was like, yeah, I, I guess they really are. And it's just, it's wild to see a, a program that has fallen this far that really is truly a, you know, I guess you could say debatably, but after going through it, they look like a top 10 program to me. And then the other thing, Joe, you briefly mentioned conference realignment. There's, of course, Florida State looks like they might be leaving the ACC. You're the one that's it's going to be better to speak to this since you live more in the college football world. Do you, where do you see this going? I mean, where does does Louisville look at if Florida State takes an exit, you know, maybe goes to the SEC or something? Do, does Louisville jump ship to go anywhere? I mean, I feel like I feel like it was almost yesterday that you know we see Louisville, Syracuse bolt for the ACC, and now like it seems like it's. I mean, it's probably been a decade at this point, but now it seems like that's falling apart. You know, I just I feel like I remember the old Big East, you know, yesterday, and now and now it looks like the ACC is getting ready to fall apart. Yeah, I think it's going to get down to maybe four, six, I guess like 18 to 20 team conferences at this rate. The prevailing thought right now is Florida State and Clemson would join the Big 12 because of football reasons. They want to play in a better football conference. The Big 12 is better than the ACC is now, uh, even if they do lose Texas and Oklahoma. That's kind of what people are thinking. I, this will have a large effect on basketball. Uh, because we're going to see teams like Louisville is going to try to get into the Big 12. A lot of their rivals historically are in the Big 12. They have West Virginia and Cincinnati right there. Um, you know, Pittsburgh will probably try to get in the Big 12 as well. How many spots are they going to take? I mean, maybe max of 20. And again, then you have to figure out what everyone else is doing. That could be tough. But what you're going to see for college basketball is you're going to see a school like Duke not get any interest from anyone. They don't have a national brand. And yes, they, they're a good college basketball team. Yes, people follow them from across the country. North Carolina is a way better brand than Duke. So, and North Carolina has football. And North Carolina, North Carolina has some successful football. So, North Carolina might go to the Big Ten, right? And that's great. And uh, then Duke might be a school that has to go independent in football or something and then join the Big East in basketball, as crazy as it might sound, because no one is lining up to get Duke. And that's sad for college basketball because we like when Duke has the ability to be a premier national contender. Whether you love them or hate them, you like – when they're doing well, so you can cheer against them or cheer for them. Good for the sport when they're when they're at least doing somewhat well. Uh, that's that's going to change everything. So I, I don't know where Louisville fits into this whole picture. I, I imagine they're going to try to get Big Twelve, but if Big Twelve if the Big Twelve gets their hands on Florida State or Clemson first, it's it's a you know they're going to go that direction. That's where the money is. They're going to take those teams. Those are solid football programs. Uh, they don't care as much about basketball. And the Big Twelve already has basketball, for being honest, especially Kansas and Arizona. Now it's going to be a different world. I, I think it'll figure itself out. It won't be as crazy. Uh, as people think, uh, in terms of like basketball will still matter uh, in, in different regards. It's not going to be the factor in decision making, but it'll still matter. It'll still have some good games. We'll still have some non conference things. I don't know how we'll figure out how many teams can make it from each conference, but that's for the committee to figure out, not me. So, all right. So, let's get to our results from this past week. Now, again, not the biggest week of college basketball. There's a couple of days off, as Greg mentioned. There's also some lighter schedules, whether, you know, scheduling teams like that are smaller to come around the holidays is a little bit easier or not. I don't know. TV contracts also play a, a world in here. So, let's start it off with Providence beating Marquette 72 to 57. Kim English gets his first big win as Providence head coach in this one. Devin Carter, 22 points, eight rebounds. Surprisingly, he's the leading scorer for Providence this year. Uh, over Bryce Hopkins, who had a very good year last year. And he's still playing fine, but just not at the level he was last year quite yet. Tyler Kolek had a pretty big get game with 21 points and nine rebounds for Marquette. Uh, but I think this comes down, this is, under, again, understandable loss for, for Marquette. Providence has been one of the best teams at home in college basketball over the last several years. That has kept it going from Ed Cooley to Kim English. So encouraging for them at Providence at this rate, 10-2, and two, if they just kind of do what they should do the rest of the way, they'll make the tournament. And that's not something everyone thought at the beginning of the season. Yeah, Joe, this is a great win for Providence. I, I do feel like we've kind of seen Marquette slip a little bit, but we said, I, I believe we both picked Marquette, but, and correct me if I'm wrong and you pick Providence, but we said that that Hopkins Carter tandem is dangerous. There's a couple other pieces on that team. They were at home. 
you know, we were expecting maybe a little bit of a of a uh, not not a step back with Ed Cooley leaving, but maybe like maybe not necessarily seeing them take a jump this year, even though they were turning two of their best players. But it looks like they're going to be competitive in the Big East, and I mean. You know, it looked like coming into the season when we were looking in the preseason, it's like, well, we don't know what what UConn's going to be. Everybody's picking Marquette to win the league. I I, I believe I did. I, I can't recall at, at this point what we pit, what you picked in our uh, preseason. But I mean, Providence looks like they could compete for a top three spot in the Big East at this point. You got to remember, they also have that Oklahoma win that looks pretty decent right now. I think them and Carolina are the only two teams to be Oklahoma. And I believe that was in Oklahoma for Big East Big 12. Uh, so, I mean, they're putting a nice little resume together. Obviously, this is this is a home win, but this is I I can't imagine Marquette, you know, dropping out of the top 30 or 35. Or if it, if they do, you know, it would be borderline. So this is this is going to be a, a borderline quad one, quad two win for for most of the year. So good win for them to pick up, and definitely a team worth keeping an eye on uh, in Big East contention. Do have to remind you, Greg, they did lose by 21 points to Oklahoma. So <laughs> I had that flipped. <laughs> oh, no. They did not. Oh, they, no. <laughs> they was on the road. They did not win it. But they're still 10 and 2, as you said, still in a good spot in the Big East. And protecting their home floor, I mean, they, they could be one of those teams where if they lose a couple games on the road throughout the Big East, it doesn't affect them as much. I do think they're a team that will make the tournament. I do think they can be dangerous in the tournament because of their one two punch. Uh, very good start by Kim English here. But let's keep it moving, Greg. We have Memphis beating Virginia 77-54. Wasn't really much of a game at all. It was at halftime, and then and then Memphis just kind of pulled away. Javon Quinterly's having a great season. Obviously, we know him from a couple different stops at this point. He's been around forever. He looks like a future pro, and that's not something you could say for his entire career due to injuries and due to just um, his role at Alabama as well. Uh, but he had a pretty big game. He had, a, he had a three, I know, that was pretty – deep and it made the crowd go nuts in this game from what I was watching and Virginia it's it's one of those things that kind of like the haters have always said if someone can score more than like 70 points on them they're gonna lose like this is the same Virginia team in that regard I don't think there's much different there they they're a team I'm still not even sure they'll make the tournament they could pick off some good teams here and there but I just don't I don't know it's hard it's hard to see this team being that good and I think it's maybe why we haven't really talked about them as much as maybe people would have thought because they were 22 when this game started yeah, Joe, you already mentioned Quinn early, obviously running the point out there. They, they like having him out there. He, he provides a dynamic uh, one-two kind of thing. But Joe didn't mention David Jones. Uh, he's been around a few places. Uh, DePaul and St. John's, according to my notes. Uh, he's averaging 21 points and six and a half boards. He had 26 in this game. Definitely a great showing for him. Uh, this was the first time I really – and I sat down and watched this game, Joe, and I, I believe when we were putting the outline together last week, you mentioned this game. I was like, oh, maybe we can pick it, maybe we won't. Uh, I did not put it on. It ended up being a rank versus rank, so I'll, I'll take the L on that one say this is when we should have been picking uh, one of the bigger games of the week. But obviously it didn't turn out that way. Uh, I did sit down and watch this game, and, and they just – I mean, there were times where it felt like Virginia was kind of like trying to claw back into the game, but – you know, it, Memphis looks like a great team. Uh, I was I was looking at their. I don't have it pulled up right this second, but I was looking at their resume. They have a couple of good wins at this at this point. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but um, 38th in the net. So this has got to be one of Penny's better teams, uh, at least at least the start. Um, and that we'll get to FAU in a little bit, but that FAU Memphis game uh, is looking like kind of the American regular season uh, title. So they've got wins over Clemson and Texas A&M. And that Texas A&M win was away. Um, they do have a loss to Villanova. We don't know what's going on with Villanova. They have a loss to Ole Miss, but Ole Miss is still undefeated. This Virginia win is a quad two. You know, it, it, it may borderline. It, Virginia's 37th in that right now. It, it's probably going to flip-flop between Q2 and Q1, but I would imagine that's probably going to be a Q2 <clears throat> excuse me, win uh, come tournament time. So Putting a little bit of a uh, putting a little bit of a resume together. They did they did have a little bit of a scare. Uh, I believe later that week they played they played Vanderbilt. Did they not? Uh, right. And that is registered as a quad four game, and they darn near lost that game. So good for them for for pulling that out because we wouldn't want to. Uh, right now the resume is not bad. The only two, the only losses are are, are quad one. Uh, you know, luckily that Villanova game was a, was a neutral site. It was that um were they in was that in the Bahamas? Was that in uh, 
uh, Battle straight. for Atlantis. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, this this looking to be one of one of Penny's better teams. I don't know what their ceiling is. I mean, uh, we haven't even mentioned yet that they just picked up Naquan Tomlin. Joe and I talked about earlier this year that uh, he left Kansas State and under some interesting circumstances, Penny's now picked him up. There's some pieces to this team, Joe. We haven't even mentioned Caleb Mills coming off the bench. There's another name that's well traveled. So mm-hmm. this team could be dangerous. It's it's difficult to to say what, but if you remember last year, I know everybody talks about the what ifs, but you know, they're they're a bucket or two away from, you know, who knows what in, in the tournament. Last year, FAU goes to the final four. I'm not saying that would have been Memphis, but you know, we could have been we could have been looking at maybe them having a sweet 16 under their belt, and then we might be really looking at this team differently. Yeah, I think they are a team that uh, maybe because the recruiting class wasn't as good as Penny has had in the past, maybe got overlooked, but they hit the transfer portal hard and they got some good players, and then they – how often do you get a chance to pick up a player like Naquan Tomlin uh, midseason? Not very often, so uh, we'll see what he does there. We'll see – I mean, I, I guess he's cleared to play, ready to go, starting in uh, January with the, with the spring semester – um whatever happened in kansas state apparently there's people who's upset with how it was handled some people say that he should have been more severe less severe i have no idea with all the details we have so far but um you don't usually get a chance to pick up a player like that they could be a team that no one wants to face in the NCAA tournament well i don't know what that might be maybe a five or four seed that second third round maybe you don't want to play so uh we'll see if quinterly can keep it up he's added some moves to his game as you mentioned david jones playing well as uh, as well uh, big win for Memphis in this one. I think anytime you play in this league like the AAC, getting a win at a conference against a power conference team is very big. Speaking of that, we have Cal State Northridge. The Matadors beat UCLA 76-72. to Now, I did not get a chance to watch this one. I'm just going to give my overall thoughts on things for, for this you know UCLA program because that's what we're really talking about. Cal State Northridge. Big West is actually pretty good this year, but like I don't think they're even going to win that. Uh, based on some of their losses already this year. UCLA, 5-5 five and five on the season right now, I believe. And they are not looking good. They It makes you wonder what Mick Cronin's doing, what the future of this program is is, is going to be. They have uh, some pretty bad, bad sound bites of themselves where he's calling out other players on Villanova, and it makes no sense for him to do that. Are we saying he can't win big without Jaime Jaquez, without you know Tiger Campbell, all those guys he had in his first couple of years at UCLA? I, I don't know. This is a... A very weird situation, and and I I'm gonna say they're pretty much toast in terms of tournament chances this year, and that's just very abnormal for again a team that has a lot of history, a program that has a lot of history, and a team that should have enough talent to get the job done. Yeah, when you take a deeper dive at their at their resume, if they hadn't had that Cal State, which by the way, Joe, I I don't have it in front of me, but I remember actually tuning into this game because. I saw the score. I think it was on ESPN plus or something. Um, and I believe they showed the, the big West like coaches preseason poll. And I'm pretty sure Cal state was picked. The Northridge was picked. Like gotta, gotta be specific. Cause I believe there's more than one in that conference, but I believe Northridge was picked like eighth or something in the conference. So I know we've talked about a few other big West teams as, as possible noisemakers, uh, you know, that might have a low seat and be able to pull off an upset later in the year. But, this is not a good. This is not a good loss for them. But if you look at the rest of their resume, their other losses are Marquette, Nova, Ohio State, Gonzaga, Maryland. I mean, like, you know, like it's one of it's another one of those like if you if you were to remove this game, like it wouldn't be one of those. You know, I don't know. They just they haven't shown us anything, and the only thing they've shown us at this point is that one. Uh, you know, bad loss, no good wins to, to counteract that. So I would agree with you. I mean, shy of some sort of miracle run through the Pac-12 or a Pac-12 tournament championship at this point, I, I they're not a tournament team. And I mean, they lost, they've lost a, their their most of their core identity of players from you know over the last two three years. I my uh Johnny Juusang. I mean, just uh, I know a Bona is still there, but. A lot of their guards are younger or foreign transfers or not transfers, but players they picked up from, um, you know, Europe and whatnot. So, I mean, I've, I, Joe, I wanted to pick your brain on this. I've, I've started to hear some people mutter of Mick to Louisville, you know, with all the things going on in Louisville. And this is other podcasts. So just be, I'm not going to name anybody specific, but I just, that's, it sounds strange to me. It doesn't seem like he would need to like, parachute into a new place kind of like Shaka did out of Texas. Hey, this is one, this is one bad year for a coach that's had a, you know, 
maybe not a, a UCLA type, you know, caliber couple of seasons, but I mean, he's held his own out there. So obviously had the, the, the final four run not too long ago where they uh, lost That was, that was the year they lost to Gonzaga on the Jalen Suggs half court shot, I believe. And then Gonzaga got beat by Baylor in the, uh, in the title game. But I, I just, I heard that. And I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but the, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I don't. I don't know if you think differently. So I just wanted to to hear your thoughts on that. I don't think he's there yet. I mean, I would say he's got a job that is safe for the rest of the year. If he does this again next year, where it's looking midway through the season, maybe, and they look like they don't have it, maybe that's when you start thinking about a move. That obviously doesn't t- work time wise with the Louisville job. It'll be open this cycle, not next cycle. Uh, I think it's mostly a local thing. He's obviously from the Cincinnati area, close enough to Louisville. That he has experience at Murray State. You know, there's Kentucky college programs like to have the in-state guys come in and, and do stuff there. I would say he – I wouldn't put it totally past him to take the job, but I think being at UCLA is a better job than, than Louisville if you take it, like, just from a head coaching perspective. Uh, obviously, they have the history. They have being in L.A., they can recruit the whole state of California. They're joining the Big Ten. There's more certainty with that. I just I don't see it unless there's like a hey we might be firing you at the end of the year type of thing going on. I just don't think they're at that point yet. Like there, if you have a chance where you make a Final Four and then you have one bad year after it, you know, after having a Final Four success in the past, I think you get one bad year. Well, Joe, their last three years are Final Four, Sweet Sixteen, Sweet Sixteen. Mm-hmm. Now. They had higher seeds in those Sweet 16 years, so if you want to say they didn't, they didn't meet expectations, fine. But I mean, it's still the NCAA tournament, single elimination tournament. Anything can happen. But just when I started hearing that, I, I'm just sitting here like, I don't know. This, this seems weird. I, I don't. I maybe it's just one of those kind of UCLA fans or or people analyzing UCLA kind of give it that Indiana lens where it's like, well, we're, we're a blue blood always have been a blue blood. So we just can't have years like this, but this is one year after, you know, three straight sweet 16 appearances and, and one final four. I, I just, I don't know. It just sounded strange to me again. I, I just like, it sounded like someone was explaining it. It's like, well, you, you know, you're in trouble and, and kind of like Shaka did where he parachuted into uh Mar- uh Marquette out of Texas because he was in, in hot water there. But I, I just, I don't, I don't see the hot water. I, I not even, it's not even simmering for me. I, I don't, I don't know. I disagree with that, but obviously, you know, what do we know? We're just, you know, you and me shooting the breeze here. So I will say it does give a little bit more confirmation bias that I don't think he was right for the job in the first place. He had a good tournament run final four. And then, as you said, didn't quite live with expectations, but it was solid years for UCLA. And, you know, if you're asking me gun to my head right now, is he going to be the head coach of UCLA in two or three years? I'd probably say no. And I don't think it's because he leaves for the NBA or a better job. I think he's probably going to be fired. I We saw what he did at Cincinnati where he had Big East teams. He did do a good job resurrecting the program and getting him to be somewhat competitive. Made the tournament, never did anything in the tournament ever at UC. I think he made one Sweet 16 and all the time he was there. It's going to be... You know, it's going to be a tough sled in these next couple of years. He's got to find some good recruits or find a transfer portal. He's got to find some sort of edge uh, for UCLA, which is not something he should have to do. So maybe it's NIL money. Joe, the only other thing to keep in mind is, is, and not that I've heard anybody say this, but it also depends on what Mick wants. If Mick doesn't like being out on the West Coast, once, of course, remember he comes from UC and before that Murray State, if he wants to be back in the Midwest or on the East Coast somewhere, that's obviously a, a variable that neither you nor I have any insight on or, or you know, would be able to predict. Uh, we just obviously don't get the chance to interview Mick. But, Mick, if you're listening and you want us to interview you on this, we're, we're more than happy to. But, uh, you know, I, I just that's the only variable to me, and I just don't know if people are hearing whiffs of that of maybe he doesn't like it out there. But that is 100% speculation on that on my part because I just I just don't see anything to tell me that he's in trouble to the point where he might you know consider taking another job unless it's something again that he wants and that's just a variable that you know we don't have yeah i don't the only thing you can think of is um you know his father's a big influence in his life whether he's i don't know if he moved his father out with him to la whether his his dad is still in cincinnati area or still you know around the cincinnati area somewhere i have no idea so things change i mean even four years at this point five years ago things change maybe situations change and he wants me back i don't know but it'd be hard to pass on a job that is in la that 
you hypothetically could have some of the best NIL money out there based on the location. Uh, one of the best recruiting grounds in, in the country as well. It'd be, it'd be tough to pass on. I, I don't think he's looking for another job either. But we'll keep tabs on it the rest of the way. It's going to be interesting to see what UCLA does. Maybe they can rack up some wins in the Pac-12, at least make it look a little bit more respectable this year. Let's move on to Wednesday of last week, Greg. We'll start with Duke and Baylor. Duke wasn't even at full strength for this game. Tyrese Proctor was out, and they still win 78-70. to Now, this was a game where I think if it was two weeks ago, Greg, we, we had even mentioned last week that we probably would have taken Baylor. But last week happened, Baylor got blown out by Michigan State, and we kind of started saying, you know what, Duke might win this game. And I think the biggest thing for Duke, for me, Greg, is even though Proctor was out, those freshmen are starting to step up and play big time, and that's exactly what we said was the biggest problem for them, is they just they can't be just Kyle Filipowski. They need other guys to step up and provide uh, some solid performances, and they got that in this game for sure. Yeah, uh, just to, to clarify, still out so they've they've been playing without Tyrese Proctor for some time now and the only reason I'm, I'm making that specific point is because I want to say it was Bill, Billis was calling this game I believe and maybe it wasn't Billis but I know whoever was calling the game said you know one of these blessing in disguise type situations where Proctor's absence is giving these freshmen more playing time in high pressure situations such as this game so this could really work out for them uh, just like you already said, Joe, we've been saying, man, this is, you know, this is an all Filipowski team. Now, now Proctor's not played for a couple of games and I'm, you know, I got the box score up right now, all five stutters and double figures. It is, it is a little concerning, only four bench points, Ryan Young playing a little bit here and there. TJ Power also off the bench, doesn't even take a shot. We know that those guys can contribute. And obviously we would be looking at this a little bit differently if Tyrese Proctor was playing. So I am curious. Uh, I don't. I don't have an update of, of when his what his timetable is looking like right now in front of me. But I am wondering what the rotation is going to look like. You know, when he comes back in. It's just one other thing to know is is Stewart's still not playing. That's that's a guy that I feel like we saw a lot early in the year. I know Reeves. Uh, we saw him. There was a game where they had foul trouble earlier in the year, and it was I think it was Phil Powski and Young had foul trouble, so he was seeing some time. It still worries me. It still kind of looks like only a couple of guys. This is this is definitely a plus. This game, this result, definitely a plus. Of course, like you already mentioned, Baylor coming off that Michigan State blowout. So take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, we were talking about this Duke team preseason as a national title contender. We've definitely taken a step back. They would really have to work their way back in to give us that trust again. Oh, absolutely. I think maybe we went from the start of the season national title contender to like a month or month and a half into the season, maybe thinking, okay, this is a six or seven seed in the tournament. I mean, their one player could be dangerous in the tournament and be win a game or two to now it's like, Oh, maybe they're like a five or, you know, five or six seed, four or five seed moving on up a little bit and getting a little bit more comfortable. And you're right. Maybe blessing in disguise there. Not that you ever want to see anyone get injured, but you can find out more about your team. And I think for, for John Shire, there's obviously still a lot of pressure on him taking over this job. It is year two, but uh, I think having maybe more of a, a reasonable opportunity to feature some of the freshmen is a good thing. And they got their result out of it. You know, again, right now, four or five seeds, still not thinking they're national title contenders. Can they work their way up there? Yeah, I think they can keep on developing like that. And if he John Shire does get him back to that point, that'd be a heck of a coaching job. Probably won't win many national coach of the year awards just based because the preseason expectations were already high and they already started off low, but I, I think it's still worth noting. Next game up, we have Seton Hall and UConn. A surprising result here. Seton Hall wins 75 to 60. Now, Greg, we had uh, a couple good performances from Seton Hall. Not going to take anything away from them, but this is just weird because UConn looks like they run rough shot through everyone just like they did last year. And then they get to the big East schedule and then they start losing games. So, I'm probably not going to overreact to this one and say, oh, UConn doesn't have it anymore. They need to figure some things out. It wasn't the best performance by any means, but I think just going on the road in the Big East is tougher than people will give it credit for. It's going to be, I think Mark Titus has said this on his podcast, um, you know, the Big 12 might be better conference, but the Big East will have maybe more fun or will have more results like this. Joe, that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I don't have the stat in front of me, but... I'm pretty sure it was last year. They only lost like one or two games outside of the Big East. UConn did. 
and all of their basically all of their losses came inside the Big East. Maybe maybe we're seeing that again. One note you didn't mention: Donovan Klingon gets hurt in this game. Uh, I believe he's going to miss a couple of weeks. I didn't even realize this, Joe. 14 points in 14 minutes before he exited the game. Yeah. It's a pretty big impact. So, unfortunately, maybe it was maybe it was. Hey, maybe he's coming along, but we're not gonna we're not gonna give UConn. You know, I, I know you said you're not going to worry about them, but we're not necessarily just going to write this off because we've also seen this team running on full steam without Donovan Klingon being a big big presence. So, I don't want to say this is an excusable loss, but I don't want to say it's also like a bad loss because you're right. It's a road game. It's the big East. It's just anything can happen. I mean, Seton Hall's not necessarily a bad team. I mean, I don't think I had them on my radar as a tournament team. And maybe, maybe this win becomes something that catapults them into, um, into, you know, maybe competition at this point, they're only 88th in the net. So they would definitely have some work to do this. This win definitely helps them out, but uh, I, I'm with you. I, I still think that this team, even without Donovan Klingon is, is going to keep, keep on steamrolling some teams. I, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Um, I, I, I don't know if you have, if, if you have off the top of your head, how, how long Klingon is out. That, that that's just an interesting thought. So um, I know it's a couple of weeks, but uh, I don't know. Um, I can't even remember who the, Oh, the um, Samson Johnson is, is their, their backup uh, big man. And he's, he's, he provides them a little bit more of an athletic type, more defensive base. Uh, I, every time you turn on a game, if you watch UConn at all this year, whoever's calling the game is going to say 95% of his points come off dunks. So, you know, it's a little bit different than Klingon, but they should be able to sustain, uh, you know, the, the probably the top spot in the Big East, at least, you know, until he comes back. Yeah, main concern for me for UConn is mostly just making sure they can get into a rhythm, have the chemistry be right, have the rotations broken down the right way, because we've had different times where, we still probably haven't seen them at full strength. Like even Castle coming back hasn't been 100% when Klingon's been 100%. It's it's we're gonna have to see what happens with this team. I, I think that would be something that might hold me back from saying, hey, they could be another national championship contender. If more injuries pile up or they can never get on the same page. You want to see these teams starting to like play a little bit hotter, a little bit more together in March, and uh, maybe just not possible for UConn this year. But I would say. I would not pick against them right now. Just with how they are, this is not a bad loss. Seton Hall, just to prove how tough the Big East is at home, went to Xavier, played at Xavier, lost by like 20. So <laughs> that's just how it goes. Oklahoma, North Carolina is the next game up. This was in the Jumpman Invitational. North Carolina wins it 81-69. to I think this game, more than anything to me, Greg, proves that North Carolina doesn't have to worry necessarily about last year, you know, highly rated and falls off the map. Also, R.J. Davis is their best player. Um, or it's not Armando Baycott anymore. R.J. Davis is on fire this season, scoring above 20 points, I believe, in like five or six straight games at this rate. Oklahoma still has some work to do. I think we're still trying to figure them out because they weren't ranked very highly in the preseason. It's just, I, I don't know. I, and then we mentioned it last show, Greg. I don't know how much to believe in them. I don't know if the Big 12 is going to beat them up. I don't know, you know, probably make the tournament, but I don't know how, how what seed they might get. It's, it's a team that I think we still have a lot to learn about even after this game. If I said to you, one of these two teams is going to be, you know, top five in the Big 12, Oklahoma or BYU, who do you have more confidence in right now? You've got to pick one of these teams. You're putting, you know, you're getting some some good money on, on one of those two teams. They just got to finish top five. I'd probably pick Oklahoma at this point. Uh, I, I know it's, it's, it's it kind of stinks again. It's like when we look at BYU, it's like, well – you know, if they weren't in the Big 12, they'd probably be in for a fantastic year. But that that Big 12 is just going to be a juggernaut. This is this is obviously uh, Oklahoma now their only loss. Just again to reiterate, Joe pointed out I had the the result with Providence flipped. It was a big win. It was a, a blowout win for Oklahoma, not Providence. So just making sure we're we're clear on that. But they don't have any quad one wins yet. And there's not really anything that's borderline that I'm seeing. So, you know, this was their, I mean, we said it last week on the pod, this was their biggest test and, you know, a 12 point loss, but, you know, at a neutral, we'll see. It's just a team to keep watch on again, kind of have that preseason bias on Yeah, We didn't think much of them, but, you know, at this point, it's not like they have no good wins. It's just they don't have, you know, any any elite top tier wins. And and I'd like to see before we start trusting them, I'd like to see something, you know, them them pick off a good team. 
Um, and this year it seems like anybody can do that. But before I, I consider them a, a contender or, you know, anything above middle of the pack in the big 12, I want to see a big win from them. So I don't have their schedule up right now. I was going to pull it up real quick and see what we might look at. We, we are not picking any of their games this week. We're really not picking much of these games this week because there's not a lot going on, but um, they've got two bye games coming up and then they open their big 12 schedule with Iowa state TCU, Kansas. So just have to see, um, we're not really you can kind of put them on the back burner for the next week or two. Uh, we're really not going to see anything from them for the next couple weeks. So, Joe, any other any additional thoughts? I got nothing. Still trying to figure out this team. I think they'll probably go into the Kansas game without another loss on their resume. They've dropped from seventh in the rankings to 12. We know the rankings aren't necessarily the greatest uh, right now, especially there's a lot of complaints over the holidays with how things were ranked, which shows that people are human, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think I would take Oklahoma over BYU. I have a lot more faith in them. But how much faith is that? I have no idea. All right, we'll go to the last game last Wednesday. We'll recap. It is Villanova beating Creighton in overtime, 68-66. to Villanova remains one of the peculiar teams in college basketball this year. Eric Dixon is a very good player. I'd argue one of the best in the country, probably All-American this year. 32 points and six rebounds. It's been very, very good, as much as Mick Cronin might not think he's a good athlete. Probably going to be in the pros next year. Creighton's, this is... This is starting to get a little bit alarming, I would say. They, they're they a team that we we had national championship or at least Final Four maybe projections for them this year. They, they could At least they could do that. And, you know, they lose Nemhard. They bring in Ashworth. It doesn't seem like it's going as well. Alexander is such a key factor. When he plays very well, they have a shot to win games. When he doesn't play well, they don't. He did play well in this one. It did go to overtime. Villanova still was able to get the win. Um, Dixon was able to hit a big go-ahead three-point shot to give them the win uh i again college basketball teams this year i have it's kind of hard to make sense of everything yeah a reminder this team has already lost to colorado state they lost to unlv so they don't like playing the mountain west now they lose to villanova their best win is bama for some reason the the net loves bama i don't know why but they're ninth in the net right now I, it's one I, I can't really figure out but their other best win is nebraska so I'm with you. They got a, now. They do have a big test coming up this week that we're going to pick. I uh, won't won't show my cards just yet, but this is definitely a team that, again, another one of those. You know, we were kind of high on preseason, and and you know they may be faltering a little bit. Important to note, Joe, this was this was you know a home game for them. So we said going on the we just talked about how going on the road is tough in the Big East. So you darn well better win your games at home that you're supposed to win. This Villanova team, I I is just strange and and you know i i know you thought i was weird for picking them in the back in the bahamas they're currently sitting at 31st in the net i just i just i don't even know what what this team is wins over you know this creighton win carolina that memphis wins looking better and better but then they've lost to drexel and penn and st joe's uh i don't i just i don't know it just they're just all over the place i just Joe, sometimes I wish teams would just figure out what they are and let us know so we can, you know, we can either keep paying attention to them or be done with them. That would just make the sport a little bit easier. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. So I, I don't know, Joe. Is this a tournament team? Is it not a tournament team? I, 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 I really, I hate to play the fence, but I just, I don't know. I would say probably not just because of how many bad losses they're going to have. Even if St. Joe's could turn into a a solid team in the A-10. I mean, you still got Penn. You still have Drexel. You still have Kansas State, which, you know, not a terrible loss, mind you, especially it being on the road. But it just – it seems like it's too much to overcome, which is crazy because, again, they have talent on this roster, and Eric Dixon is very good, and they have wins now that are going to be really, really good, including, like, North Carolina, and, and Maryland has kind of rebounded, and now Creighton, and Memphis, too. Like, they are – the team that I would say is the team I would say, or the team I would say we have the hardest time figuring out this year. You know, we sometimes say in, in NFL games, like these don't bet this game. If it's a close spread or one that just doesn't make sense, or you don't know what you're getting, this is the team. I wouldn't bet on anything. I wouldn't bet on a future. I wouldn't bet on them for any game whatsoever. The rest of the year, I, I don't touch them. Don't go near them. It could be Eric Dixon wills them to a win. It could be they, don't bring it that night. I, I don't know. It's just, it's too weird of a team. I could see them very easily losing at home to Xavier. Um, January 3rd is their next game. I could see them losing that game. And I don't think Xavier is all that great this year either. So buckle up for a fun big East. That's all I can say about that. 
But let's go to our last game of the week. We are going to recap. This one was on Saturday. Big game. We had Florida Atlantic and Alabama. Actually, our pick was a little bit cut off after uh, last week's episode. Some technical difficulties uh, we're figuring out week by week here. We both picked Arizona, I believe. Florida Atlantic. Joe, and- you don't tell the you don't tell the people that we since it got cut oh. off. You tell everyone that we picked FAU. We're, wink, we're, wink, nudge, nudge. We're all about accountability here. We're all about accountability. Uh, both picked Arizona. Florida Atlantic gets the win, ninety six, ninety five. Now Arizona did have a chance to win this at the end. Caleb Love had a shot from three. Uh, just desperation did not go in. Have to give it up to FAU though. They've had a weird non conference game or non conference schedule. Um, where they, they played some tough teams. They lost to Bryant, but they were able to get the win here. John L. Davis, 35 points, nine rebounds. I mean, heck of a game from him as well. I think they're showing that they can be, like, you know, can be a very good team, could make another Final Four. This is a game that they'll want to remember because Arizona had been the team we've been talking about being one of the top two or three teams in the country. Yeah, this is the team that, that we were talking about preseason. Of course, like you mentioned, that Bryant slip up. The other losses to Illinois, we both like Illinois. Maybe not as a top 10 team, but we both think they're a solid team. Um, I think they're probably maybe a top 15 team. Uh, this is this might be one of the best wins of the year. I know it was a, a neutral court game, but uh, I, I mean, this is this is definitely going to be a staple on their resume, going to affect their seating. Definitely, in my mind, counteracts that, that Bryant loss, you know, this team is is looking like it's turning into exactly what we thought it was going to be, you know, a solid team. And I just keep, you know, I already said it here, but I just keep getting excited for that Memphis FAU game. Looks like it's going to be appointment television, especially when you look at the backdrop of what happened in the tournament last year between those two teams. Of course, last year they were in two different conferences. FAU was in CUSA. Memphis was in the American. So that's why they matched up in the first round. Typically you wouldn't see, two teams from the same conference playing the first round. Well, now they are in the same conference, FAU moving up to the Americans. So that's definitely, for me, a, a game I'm looking ahead to, and, and I don't have the schedule. I, I, do they do double round robin? I don't I don't, I don't. don't know. Are we going to get to see them play twice? I, obviously, they're going to play at least once, but... I do not know, actually. So let's figure that one out. I don't know how the new scheduling works with the, all the teams who left and everything. But either way, you're right. I think it's... it's we're going to have some appointment television to watch there. Um, I Again, I want to thank everyone who schedules these games. It's always good to have them, especially in a down week like this. Like, I don't know, if more teams can schedule. Like, FAU, it's a Saturday. There's some NFL games going on. But, like, you know, if there's some blowout, I mean, we saw the Bengals, our Bengals get blown out by the Steelers on Saturday. Um, but what, like, if you have a college basketball game on, FAU probably got so many more viewers than they ever would have thought. And it, all it took was, hey, we made the Final Four last year, head into this year, let's schedule some teams. They're going to want us on their radar because we brought a lot of players back. So uh, thanks, everyone, for scheduling this one, for sure. That's that's always good for college basketball. We always talk about how a lot of people tune out of college basketball. They maybe watch Champions Classic, and then they tune out until NFL or college football is over. But this this gives you a chance to watch these games like that, and, and those matchups will do that. So. Those are, that's our recap for last week. Let's make our picks for this week. Again, a lighter week. It's not much going on here uh, in terms of good games, just with people winding down their non-conference schedule, getting ready for conference schedules in a lot of cases. That's just how it's going to be. So let's start it off with San Diego State and Gonzaga. Uh, this one is the 29th, and it is at Gonzaga. I have this game. Again, there's there's not a lot this week, uh, and obviously we're, we're – podcasting on a bit of a shorter week because you know yesterday was was uh, or not yesterday but monday was christmas and there have been no games for a couple of days so we are doing a little bit of a of a shorter podcast shorter show um or at least in terms of number of things we're talking about i have this on here because i think this is an important game for both teams both teams are getting ready to go into their conference schedules so i i don't know i know i brought this up with gonzaga a couple of weeks ago when they played uh, Washington is like, hey, this is a game they need. They're not going to get a lot of opportunities in the new WCC without BYU. I, you know, San Diego State might have a few better opportunities in the Mountain West. You know, just between you know Colorado State and a few other teams that look like they might be decent. So, I think this is a bigger game from Gonzaga. I'm going to pick Gonzaga again. I still don't think this is a national championship contender. They're just too short of a team in terms of. Uh, their rotation, not in terms of height, but in terms of the, the you know just the number of pieces. Maybe Steel Venters, if we, as we've already mentioned, would be that difference. Maybe he wouldn't, but I think they need this game. 
if they want to be looking at a decent seed, if they drop this game, if they had won the Washington game, I'd maybe say, all right, maybe they don't need it as badly. But I, I think this is, I mean, this is really going to be their, their last opportunity to, to show us anything until, you know, really the NCAA tournament. I, I, I can't even think off the top of my head who their biggest competitor in the WCC is going to be this year. I know there's somebody I'm forgetting. I don't know if it's Santa Clara or something. I know there's somebody that, that is probably having a decent year and, and you know, I don't want to, give anybody up but uh, joe what are you thinking on this one yeah i'm going gonzaga i think it'll be interesting to watch uh, Jaden jaden versus graham ek uh in the post that's the matchup i'm watching in this one um i do think gonzaga is a much better team i think they'll get the win i obviously the lack of depth concerns me in any big game they play but they're at home in this one and you're right uh i don't know if there is a team in the wcc this year um st mary's st mary's is eight and six uh san francisco is ten and four so, you know, San Diego's 9-4, and four, Santa Clara's 9-5. and five. It doesn't mean that the teams are bad, and a lot of times they play some good teams, but I think the WCC is really bad. This might be a good thing for college basketball overall, though, because maybe Gonzaga joins a different conference. Just something to think about here. All right, so the next game we're going to talk about, we have Washington and Colorado. This one's also on the 29th. It is at Colorado. This game is actually not on Pac-12 Network. That's another reason I picked this. We think both of these teams are decent. Colorado, I'm higher on than uh, Washington at the moment, but we've seen we've seen some spurts from Washington. There are a few pieces on that roster that we like, uh, some of Joe's former Kentucky players, but this is a game that we're probably not going to get to see a ton of, of Pac-12 action just with the Pac-12 Network. This is the last year of the Pac-12 this is a, a decent game for both teams. Colorado currently sitting 33rd in the net, Washington at 58th. So, you know, a good, a good, uh, I don't know if this is the opening Pac 12 game for each of these teams. I don't have their schedules pulled up in front of me, but it's, I would imagine if it's not their first, it's probably their second game. But a, a Pac 12 game that you can watch on regular TV, I, count me in. So uh, I like KJ Simpson and Colorado to take this one. Um, I was high on this team in, in the preseason. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep riding that and, and pick them to win this one. I think Colorado for sure for me. Yeah, Washington's had some good games. They've had some bad games as well. Um, like my former Kentucky guys there, I do think that they have a roster that is capable of being okay in the Pac-12. But the problem is being okay in the Pac-12 doesn't really get you anywhere in college basketball these days. I think Colorado has a roster on the flip side that if they're able to reach their full potential could be uh, pretty dangerous, maybe not in terms of – I don't know, national championship or anything like that, but could win the Pac-12, could surprise some people. I mean, you know, maybe Arizona slips up here or there and they're able to take advantage. If not, maybe second or third. I, I mean, Colorado and Utah are two of the teams I think I, I've mentioned a decent amount on this podcast of, of teams I kind of like. They're doing okay to start. We'll see how they go. Obviously, some talented freshmen and KJ Simpson and Eddie Lampkin uh, on this Colorado team. So we need to see more of them. This is a good game to, to pick, but I do think Colorado is going to win this one. I think they might win it pretty easily too. Next one up, we have on Saturday, December 30th, we have Marquette, or excuse me, Creighton at Marquette. Uh, this one will be at 2 p.m. Eastern. And I think this is going to be an interesting one for both teams trying to figure out who these teams are this season. Yeah, both of these teams have kind of faltered a little bit here and there. Both of them maybe not quite what we thought they'd be preseason. I'm going to pick Creighton in this one. I, I, this is honestly just a gut thing. I know we just saw Creighton lose to Villanova. I can't give you a reason why I just, for some reason, my gut's telling me to go with Creighton, even though it's on the road in the Big East. But this is an interesting game for, for both teams because, you know, I just I just feel like if, if Marquette loses at home, so alarm bells might start going off for them because their expectations were so high this year. I don't want to say Creighton's in trouble if they lose this game, but it's definitely time to start thinking about, is this team really what they thought they were going to be? How much does that Ryan them hard loss to Gonzaga yeah, as a transfer, how much does that really affect their team? Uh, you know, do they have what it takes to be, you know, a Final Four Elite Eight contender this year? So, it just this is this is the biggest game of the week. Uh, it's got a, there's a, there's a lot in play for both teams. So I'm gonna pick I, I, again against my better judgment. There's just something tells me to pick Creighton in this game. So I'm gonna go with Creighton. This is a hundred percent gut, zero analysis, just going with Creighton. Sometimes that's all it takes. I mean, so you can know everything in the world. Sometimes you can still pick wrong. So. I'm going Marquette. Uh, as you mentioned, they are at home in the Big East. That is tough for teams to go in and win. I'm also thinking uh, – I've mentioned a million times how much I like their backcourt with Kolek, and, and I, I like Cam Jones a lot more than I think a lot of people give him credit for. I think Kolek gets all the headlines. Cam Jones is just opens things up for everyone. 
Uh, so I, I, I'm going to take them here. Again, I'm more concerned with Marquette in the postseason than I am in the regular season. I think they can still do really, really well and possibly win the Big East again. So I'm going to go Marquette to win this one. I think it's a pretty good, um, solid solid pick here for the one of the bigger Big East games to start the year. And Greg, you also have on this list Indiana State at Michigan State. Let's, let's get into this one. Yeah, we're not picking this game. It's just there's just not a lot going on this week. So just a, maybe a fun one to watch. Obviously, Michigan State up and down. We really don't know what they are this year. We, you know, I had them as a Final Four contender, and they've lost a few games, but now they they obliterate Baylor. This Indiana State team currently sitting twenty third in the net. They're eleven and one. Their only loss is to Bama. This game's on FS1. Just just something. So if, you know, if you're not doing anything else, something to watch. It's on the same day as Creighton and Marquette. Uh, it is not New Year's Eve. It is the day before New Year's Eve. So if you're sitting around and uh, you're, you know, you're wanting something to watch. It's on the same time as Creighton Marquette. If you want something to flip back and forth to between and during commercials. So this is, I don't care what you say, it, you know, Indiana state can be whatever they want in the net. This, this is a, a game that Michigan state's got to have if, if they want, you know, we were already in panic mode for them. The funny thing about it is, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this game is this could turn out to be one of their better wins on their resume at the moment. So I, I, I don't have their, their, net team sheet up i would imagine their best win right now is probably baylor but this could end up being one of their better wins and and you know if indiana state keeps keeps riding high and and runs through their conference i I can't remember they're in the missouri valley i don't know uh yeah they're in the missouri valley so you know if they run through and maybe this stays a a nice win for them maybe it stays a quad one win this is i mean this is if they want to have a shot of an at-large this is the kind of game they have to have considering the uh the start that they've had to the year so we're not picking this game i think we'd probably both pick michigan state it's just it's just an interesting little tidbit uh that um you know i wanted to look at and then joe i don't have this on the outline so i'm I'm throwing a curveball at you but my count unless i am missing somebody i believe there are two undefeated i'm sorry three undefeated teams left i did not mean to say two i meant to say three we've got Ole miss we've got james madison we've got houston Yep. Who is our last undefeated team? James Madison. I think they're good. I think they're legitimately Just, good. They're playing an easy conference. I will say, I'm picking Indiana State in this one, by the way, for Michigan State and Indiana State. I think they're a solid team. I'm not sold on Michigan State yet. Uh, we have to mention that, uh, I think we mentioned a couple weeks ago, we'll have to mention again, a rematch of the 1979 NBA, or the NCAA championship, Larry Bird versus Magic Johnson. I believe it's the 45th. I don't I don't know math. 45th, some, yeah. some, something anniversary of that game. Uh, and I do think... Indiana State has some guys. I mean, they're not not their leading scorer, but Robbie Avila. You maybe have seen him on social media as kind of a joke. He's a real player. Six foot ten, two forty, shoots over forty something percent from three. Sixteen point five rebounds, six point six or six sixteen point five points, six point six rebounds per game, four point two assists. Second leading scorer. Are you giving me that guy? Are you kidding me? I, I think they can win this game, and I do think they're a threat to be a a upset bid in the NCAA tournament they can win the Missouri Valley they could they could upset a team you know as a 13-4 or maybe a 12-5 um something to watch out for here I think Michigan State we, we maybe have thought like hey maybe they're over the hump because of Baylor well, Baylor maybe not that good either Baylor is not really taking it two teams either so I'll take Indiana State definitely something to keep on the back burner if you have a chance have a phone while you're watching NFL games or if you're out with friends you know just having your phone on you it's always good to, good idea to have that available to turn on some games all right Greg any final thoughts for the week no, I already threw one curveball at you. Don't need to throw another one. Okay, I will say my final thoughts are I went to the Cincinnati Stetson game on Friday. Cincinnati won. Uh, Dan Skillings uh, had, I think, like 12 of 16 shooting with like 29 points. It was pretty incredible for a guy who's pretty much just a role player. But uh, I have to say, I thought it was really – there are upgrades to what it used to be. I've not been since they've renovated the stadium. I'm not a fan of Cincinnati, so I, I have not made a point to go to it. But when, uh, you know – some of your family members are Cincinnati fans. You go and, you know, support the, support the team or, you know, support the family at least. Uh, they did a really good job with the renovations, Greg. I don't know if you've been there since, but it opened up a ton. I remember the up in the rafters, you had these awful seats. They at least painted it up there so it's a little bit better. I, I think it's a really good venue. I think that they really needed to do it before the Big 12. We obviously try to go as many games as possible. I've been to that arena. I try to go to new arenas and do new things and everything. And it wasn't a game that was really interesting. Um, but it was just, you know, got to have to note, they, they did a really good job, and it was a fun time. All right, so those 
uh, last thing I have to do is remind everyone to like and subscribe on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. That always helps us out as we move along here. Uh, as a reminder, we'll be back next week to recap this week and pick the next week of games. For now, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.